Uh, I'm excited to talk about one of my new new favorite things, which is Corto, which I've been sort of working with over the last maybe two, maybe coming up on three years since it's sort of a uh, first development. And this will be sort of an introduction to Corto um, for folks who are somewhat familiar with this idea of computational documents. And if you're sort of like coming from the R land, that's generally um, our markdown. But I think that if you also, you know, work with Jupyter Notebooks, um, this should be pretty accessible to you as well. So let's start by um, sort of defining what is Corto. Corto is a new, and you know, it's starting to age now, but still pretty new open source scientific and technical publishing system. And really the goal of Corto is to make the process of creating and collaborating dramatically better, both creating documents and collaborating with other humans, other humans who might have different choices in terms of the computational language they use, or the editor that they want to use. So in this little schematic, we can see that we can use um, a variety of computational languages. Um, you'll see, I will be talking about R today, um, but you can have just like R code cells in your Corto documents, code cells that are for Python, Observable, or Julia, or even more. Um, and in goes these code cells into a Corto document, which is ultimately a plain text markdown document and out comes a, a document that's in a that can be in a variety of formats. Here we're sort of highlighting HTML, PDF, and Word, but that's really sort of scratching the surface of what's possible with Corto. If you're familiar with the R Markdown ecosystem, I can say that Corto sort of unifies the system and extends it. So it unifies it for people who love R Markdown and it extends it for people who don't know any R Markdown. What I mean by unify is um, think of all the different R Markdown based packages um, in R that could be blog down, distill, articles, um, book down. You know, we can think of a variety of packages, each of which provide a different output um, that where the input is an RMD file and our markdown file and the output is slightly different. Um, with Corto, we have a single sort of, not only just a single QMD file, just like we had with our markdown, but we also have a consistent implementation of attractive and handy features across outputs. So um, while in our markdown land, some of the packages allowed you to do sub tab sets, for example, and some didn't. With some, you could do code folding and some didn't. With some, syntax highlighting was a little bit easier than others. Um, with Corto, all of these features are consistently implemented and they use the same syntax. It also has more accessible defaults, as well as a better support uh, for accessibility. Um, I think that, you know, ultimately uh, creating um, formats that are sort of like that abide by like all accessibility guidelines is not easy, but it's a great goal to have. And one of the things that you get with Corto is if you stick to the defaults, you'll at least get, you know, things like color schemes and document behavior that is um, that abides by some uh, accessibility guidelines. And as you uh, sort of move forward from these to do further customization, Corto allows you to um, sort of keep things accessible as well. It has guardrails, uh, which are particularly helpful for new learners. Um, so things like YAML completion, informative syntax errors, both of which I'll demo in a little bit. And finally, it has support natively for Python, Julia, Observable, and more via the Jupyter engine for executable code chunks. Um, you may have used our markdown with Python in the past. Um, so it's not like this is a completely brand new implementation, uh, completely brand new feature. But what is new is that instead of going through a package like Reticulate and still relying on the Knitter engine, Corto allows you to actually leverage the Jupyter engine which allows you to write code in not just Python, but also any of the other languages just that the Jupyter engine can handle. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, see our ladies in, uh, sorry, the Corto in action. If you would like to follow along, uh, which you're welcome to, or but you can also sort of sit back and watch, 
you can go to this repository where you'll see sort of my starting documents uh, for what I'm going to be working with. So I'm going to get out of these slides for a second and I am going to go to our studio. Um, and let's go ahead and close the slides. And I am going to start with a document um, that I have in this repository called index.qmd. It's named index for a reason. We'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, the important thing is that we have a document. Um, and in this document, you can see that on top, I have a um, YAML, so some metadata about my document. I have a title, I have denoted my format, and I'm also using the visual editor, which is an absolutely um, sort of optional thing that you can do in our studio, but something that I have been enjoying a lot. Um, the visual editor works with our markdown as well. Um, however, some of its features uh, really shine when you're editing Porto documents. So I'll demo a couple features of that as we go through as well. Um, I am going to make sure that my preview is going to show up on my viewer pane. And let's go ahead and render this document. So here's our output document, as you might be used to. Your metadata in your YAML is formatted a particular way. We can add more, um, um, we can add more fields to that. And let's go ahead and use this opportunity to demo this YAML completion. So I've started typing author and I'm going to just tab and you can see all of the sort of options that I have for my YAML of my document. Um, so this allows me to sort of not have to remember every single one of these YAML fields, but actually leverage um, the YAML completion. Let's go ahead and add my name here. And some another feature that might be helpful, particularly if you don't have a lot of compute in your documents, is this feature called Render on Save. So that each time I save my document, it re-renders it for me, which can be really nice for sort of iteratively building up a document. I said if you don't have a lot of computation, because what is happening is each time it renders, it's running through the compute. So if you have code chunks that take a little bit of time, obviously um, that, that may get frustrating, but for something simple like this, it's pretty neat. Um, so let's go ahead and do a few things that highlight the visual editor here. Um, we said that we're using the penguins data set. This is an R object, so I can do something like code formatting, which I can use my um, either a sh keyboard shortcut um, or, oops, sorry, or I can do um, sort of the toolbar here. Um, similarly, I can use a keyboard shortcut for bolding things, or I can use my toolbar here as well. Um, so what is happening as I do this? Um, I am seeing these changes in this editor that looks, you know, perhaps feels familiar if you use things like Google Docs or Word or even some note taking apps like Notion is one of the things that reminds me of. If I switch over to the source editor for a second, you'll see that our studio is writing the plain markdown for you. So we have not lost the ability of being able to sort of write in plain text, which means that as I'm writing in plain text, if I have a file that is being version controlled, my diffs are still meaningful. I can still see exactly sort of where my changes are. However, the visual editor gives me the ability to not have to stare at plain markdown code and sort of guess what the output is going to look like. I'm able to see my narrative take the form that I want it to. Um, another thing we can do that's handy um, with um, the visual editor is there may be things that, you know, that you perhaps um, regularly like forget um, how to do the syntax for, for some reason, uh, hyperlinks is one of those things for me for, um, for Markdown. So I'm gonna grab this URL of the Palmer Penguins package. And I can again, use the tools from the visual editor to um, not just um, add a link, but also add a tool tip to it. Oh, 
So let's go ahead and demo what that looks like. Oops. And you can see that um, this basically um, got this entire syntax that personally I would have a hard time coming up with on the fly in terms of the markdown syntax. So let's go ahead and render that. Um, so I have um, basically not just a hyperlink, but also like that little hover text that I can see uh, when I'm hovering on the hyperlink itself. All right, um, let's get to the code. Um, so we have some code chunks in our document. Uh, one of them is producing a plot here. So this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about um, accessibility practices. If you have particularly an HTML document that's going to be hosted on the web and um, you have a data visualization, it is a good practice to add some alternative text to your uh, plot. Um, what we can do here is we can add a new code chunk option. And if you're used to our markdown code chunk options or knitter code chunk options, you would be used to seeing those um, sort of articulated in the curly braces where we define the engine for the code chunk. But with Corto, we're able to use these code chunks um, that use the hash pipe uh, syntax. And one thing I like about these is that each code chunk goes into its own line. I find it easier to take a look at a diff uh, between sort of one version of a document and another, uh, because if I'm adding code chunk options there, it's very easy to identify what has been added. And I also don't end up with this really lengthy text for my code chunk options. So we're going to go ahead and add alternative text for our figure. I know that I have, um, sorry, that is not what I wanted. I know that I have, um, um, you know what? I am going to, I'm using something that I'm gonna show you what I'm using, but then I'm going to turn off. So with um, new RStudio, you can actually have GitHub Copilot turned on, which I have here, which keeps suggesting code for me, which is not what I might mean to uh, demo for you. So I'm going to dis, uh, uh, not enable that and go ahead and let's apply it so that it doesn't try to keep suggesting things for me and we can continue on with like what I have planned for you. So I'm going to say that I want to add a figure related code chunk option and I can easily select from the sort of the uh, YAML completion that it suggests for me. So I might here say something like a scatter plot of um, three species of penguins showing the relationship between bill depth and bill length. When you have um, lengthy um, sort of uh, text like this for your code chunk options, um, my recommendation would be to try to keep um, that sort of the length of those lines to roughly about 80 uh, characters, again, for being able to see diffs easily. So generally what I do is I say, I actually want to indicate or articulate this code chunk option in the next line. And I have my sort of my visual identifier, uh, that gray line that you can see in my editor turned on in our studio to tell me roughly where 80 characters happen. And then I can say that I'm going to um, sort of put a line break there. So if I save this, I'll see that on my output, that code chunk option went nowhere. That text is not visible for me, but that's sort of the whole point of it. Let's pop this out to a new window. And let's go ahead and inspect this uh, plot. And when I inspect the plot, um, I can see the alt text being um, sort of in the source code uh, for the HTML. So if somebody's um, sort of navigating this document with a screen reader, it's going to read out loud um, this text to them. Other code chunk options that are um, nice are uh, things, for example, if you want to have, um, you know, if you're using this uh, document, perhaps particularly for teaching or for an audience where you, they don't necessarily need to see the code all the time, but if they're curious about it, they might look into it. I might add something like code fault, and I'm going to go ahead and say true. So now my um, code 
uh, chunks have been folded and um, I can, you know, go ahead and open them up or uh, close them back up if I don't want them. Let's go ahead and while we're at it, turn off this warning as well. And again, you can see every time I'm typing code chunk options, I am um, leveraging the YAML completion for both the chunk option and also the YAML values that it can take. Now let's go ahead and make a mistake. Um, I am going to say, well, I am too used to uh, doing things the um, sort of former or markdown way. And I might say warning false indicated like this in capital letters. When I save this um, and it tries to re-render, it's giving me an error. This is not the, uh, the YAML syntax that Corto is expecting from me. But the nice thing about the YAML is, uh, sorry, this error is that it actually sort of identifies for me exactly where this issue is happening. Um, and it allows me to perhaps um, figure out where I may have gone wrong. So between the fact that it provides sort of options for me and has sort of pretty helpful, not all the time, but most of the time, um, um, error messages. I think this transition from writing things in um, our markdown to writing things in Quarto should be smooth for many of you. Let's switch things over to the visual editor. I think we lost that when I got an error and it was indicating for me uh, where the error happened and which um, line number. Um, one last thing I'll show, show in terms of chunk options, particularly if there are any of you in the audience who tend to teach things as well, or if you might take what you learn here and use it to teach Quarto. One of the things I generally find very um, sort of like difficult or cumbersome to do is when I actually want an output that shows uh, what a code chunk looks like as well. So I know that I can, you know, do things like eco false, for example, to say, don't show me that code. That's something that I've had that the option to do sort of forever. But I can also set eco to fenced. And let's take a look at the output for this. So with this, not only do I see the um, code itself, but I am also seeing the entire chunk definition with the back ticks, as well as all of the chunk options, except for the chunk option that says ecofence. So it's smart about that. And this is not a sort of a commented out chunk. So it actually is a functional chunk. We can see that we are actually loading these packages so that we're able to use them later on in our document. All right. Um, we also have a, a figure here and a table. So this is a good opportunity to talk about some of the cross-referencing abilities of Quarto, which I think are pretty neat. Um, so in order to be able to cross-reference a figure, I need to do two things. One is that I need to have a chunk label that starts with fig dash. And the other thing is that I need to have a caption for my figure. So I'm going to say fig cap. And um, let's maybe go ahead and cheat from the alternative text, um, even though generally those wouldn't be identical. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and add um, a caption to it as well. So with this, I actually have a figure and a caption that's in my output. And so wherever it says the figure below, I have a few options for inserting um, a, um, a a cross-reference. I can use the insert menu and select cross-reference, which will then list for me all the available items I have for cross-referencing. So let's try that here. And so now instead of the figure below, I have figure one and you can see uh, with the upcoming 1.4 quarter release, you actually get a nice hover preview of things that you're cross-referencing as well, which is total overkill for this document where the plot is right underneath it. But you can imagine if you're writing a longer manuscript or a book, that can be really, really handy. Um, with tables, uh, the structure is pretty similar. We want to have a special label. It's going to start with TBL, and we want to have a caption for our table as well. Um, so let's say this is the top 10 rows of the Penguin's data set. 
And so now I have a, um, I have a um, table that has a counter and also a um, caption as well. And here let's um, show the other way that we can um, do cross-referencing. So instead of going to the insert menu, I can simply start typing with at, and it will allow me to choose from things that I can cross-reference. So that's this table here, and I'm able to uh, sort of accomplish my cross-referencing that way. Um, in addition to cross-references, the visual editor makes um, citations a lot easier as well. So let's take a look at the documentation for Palmer Penguins. I'm going to scroll down to grab the DOI of the original paper where the data set uh, for Palmer Penguins was first published. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this DOI. And then let's go ahead and uh, come back to our document. And I want to insert a citation to that. I can, again, use the insert menu for inserting a citation. But let's uh, show a third way of navigating uh, a document and adding elements to it um, using uh, the visual editor. So I'm going to use the insert anything tool which I can do with a uh, command forward slash when I'm in a line. So it brings up this sort of um, insert anything tool is what it's called. I think that uh, this tool exists in Google Docs. Nowadays, I use a note taking app called Notion that I use this heavily for. So if you're used to sort of things where you can have this like keyboard interface and other authoring environments, this will feel pretty familiar to you. And it will nicely do sort of completion and search based on uh, sort of the first couple letters. So I say that I want to do a citation from a DOI and I'm going to go ahead and paste the DOI here. And let's go ahead and insert that into our document. And let's observe that a few things happened here. I got a citation inserted. Um, I also gained a new line in my YAML. And if I go to my files pane, I also gained a bib file that has all of the information that previously I would have perhaps copied and pasted from like Google Scholar. All of that is in place. And if I go ahead and save and re-render my document, I'll be able to see that my references have been added to the bottom of my document. So these are all things that for which there are solutions when you are writing plain text markdown. We haven't necessarily accomplished anything that we couldn't do with plain text markdown. What we've accomplished is sort of easier access to these elements. Um, so once you start sort of getting used to using the visual editor, um, I think that some of this, um, you know, nitty gritty becomes a lot easier. Where does the visual editor tend to, let's say, fail? Um, let's go ahead and make an error here. So I am going to make an error and try to add a um, letter to a number. So this is an R error. And what it's telling me is that, well, you can't do that, basically. Um, because I have labeled my code chunks, I can identify exactly where that is happening, uh, which code chunk it's happening. So perhaps um, this is still good enough for me and I might be able to you know, fix my error without leaving the visual editor. However, if you haven't labeled your code chunk and you try to run this, um, it's going to say something like unnamed chunk one or maybe some other chunk number in your document, which might be hard to identify. And it's going to give you line numbers but those are not visible in the visual editor. So it's during this like debugging troubleshooting stage, uh, you might wanna go back to the source editor, identify where the issue is, correct your um, mistake. And once things are working, come back to uh, the visual editor again. And frankly, I always recommend having uh, labels for your code chunks anyway. They also make it easy to navigate, especially if you have a lengthy document. So not only does it make it easier to identify where issues are, if you have a semi-informative error message, uh, but it also helps you navigate between um, uh, within your document. 
So we've said a lot about sort of writing a single document and we have a document here with sort of like three sections in it, data, species, and penguins. What if I was to uh, sort of make this into a slide deck? Uh, one of the things I mentioned early on in the talk is that the syntax of Porto is consistent between different output formats. So we generally don't need to edit our text a lot to go from one output format to another. So let's go ahead and change the output format to Reveal.js, which is what Corto uses for uh, HTML slides. And when I do that, you'll see that our studio asks you to reload the visual editor. The reason why it's asking us to do that is because of all of that completion that it was allowing us to do. The various YAML fields you might have in a Reveal.js document, so a presentation, are slightly different than the YAML fields you might have in a, a sort of a plain document. For example, the notion of a title slide doesn't exist in a document, but it does in a presentation. So in order for that YAML completion to work, it needs to reload the visual editor. So it brings up the options that would apply to the format you're talking about. So let's go ahead and reload it. And here there's a, you can see there's a bug in our studio where it like sort of doubled my uh, toolbar. Um, I, I've reported that recently. So my guess is that'll get fixed soon, but I'm gonna quit out of this document for a second and reopen it so that we can, uh, oh, whoops, reveal JS. Let's save the document, quit it and reopen it so that I get the nice, uh, bar again. And I'm going to go back to render on save and basically render this document as a slide deck. My title is now my title slide. My author field shows up where I would expect it to in a slide deck. And what happened is each of these second level headers have now become their individual um, uh, slides. With a presentation, generally, it's helpful to have like a hierarchy to your presentation. So parts and then slides in between those. So using the insert anything tool, I'll sort of add a little bit more structure to my presentation. I'm going to add a first level header. So I'm using the forward slash to bring this up and say, maybe this is my introduction. And then at the end, we can make another part or a section. Uh, let's call this analysis, another slide, maybe model one results, blah, blah. Um, model two results, blah, blah, blah. So something like this, and we can see that in our document outline, we have um, sort of the structure of our document um, and that same outline is something I can access with this little uh, menu that I get on the sidebar for my slides as well. So it allows you to sort of really keep things organized. Um, let's also go ahead and add one more heading called references so we can shoot off those references to the last slide. Okay. Um, Something that you might, you know, generally do in a slide deck is sort of uh, these bullet points, right? Generally, we have, uh, um, we use bullet points in our slides. So I can do something like some information about the model, some text about results, some comments about shortcomings or something like that. So I have something like this. And if I have a slide deck like this, chances are I don't want all of that information to appear all at once. Um, so what the way I sort of interact with um, these like sort of additional um, features for um, sort of text on my slides, if I'm in the visual editor, oftentimes you'll see these like three dots appearing whenever you can up to edit attributes about one of the elements. So let's go ahead and click on that. And it basically allows me to choose between an ordered list or a bullet list, or I can say, I want these to be incremental. So now my slides are actually going to look a little bit more like this. 
And if I go back to the source editor, you will see that it has created what we call a fence div in Pandoc. So it uses these three colons to identify a div, and then it applies a particular class to them. This is a predefined class in Corto and in Reveal.js, so I'm leveraging that. But I can also write style files myself where I, you know, uh, did create classes. So maybe everything in this class is going to be text that's red and centered. So I'm um, able to do that as well. Okay, um, let's go to code. So we had one chunk here that had fence. So I'm going to go ahead and move that away so that we can take a look at our document with sort of no options presented for eco. And you'll see that by default, Reveal.js says, you probably don't want to show your code. You know, there's limited space on your slides. That's probably not what you want to show. But if you're teaching about code or talking about code, you probably do want to show your code. And so what we can do is we can uh, give some document level options for code execution. I'll say execute, and you can see I can include a variety of these. So I'm going to say eco true so that all of my code um, is actually visible. Um, well, let's get rid of this code fold as well so we can see our code on our slide. This is good. My code is now visible, but my figure is shrunk, which seems nice, uh, but is actually quite annoying in this case because I basically can't see my uh, figure. So um, Corto uh, leveraging Reveal.js allows us to do a variety of things that used to be cumbersome to do with plain knitter, where I would maybe need to duplicate this code chunk and sort of refer back to it on a new slide. Instead, I can do something like output location and say, put this on the next slide so that it just moves my figure uh, to the next slide. And if I do that, I might want to, you know, maybe make my figure width a little bit bigger so that it takes up the whole slide. Um, like this. Alternatively, I can say that I want this to be in the next column. Or I can say I want it to be in a column fragment. And fragment is the term that Corto uses to indicate things that are happening sequentially. So incremental lists are basically an implementation of fragments as well. So what this is going to do is to show my code on the first slide and then in the next fragment reveal my output. Um, if I want to talk about particular aspects of my code, uh, one of my favorite chunk options, particularly in the context of teaching, is this option called code line numbers, which allows me to provide a character string where I can say, okay, we're gonna talk about the data, which was on line two, and then aesthetic mappings, which are on line three to six. And maybe then I want to make a comment about using a colorblind friendly scale, which is on line 10. So what this does is it allows me to, again, create fragments where particular pieces of my code are highlighted. Um, and the nice thing here is that um, I didn't have to touch my code. Like I didn't add particular sort of syntax to my code itself. This is all in the, um, in the chunk options. Why is that nice? Let's go ahead and change our document format one more time. So I am going to say, I wanna make a PDF instead. Um, and let's reload. So right now it's converting the document that I had to a PDF where you can imagine that idea of you know, going through code line numbers makes no sense. This is going to be a static document. And you can see that my code is presented, my figure is presented, that idea of columns, it, it sort of like gave up on because that doesn't apply to how we create sort of two column uh, outline uh, formats in um, a PDF document. So Corto will happily ignore the code chunk options that don't uh, apply to a particular format. You might 
find this to be helpful. I would say that 90% of the time, I find this to be super helpful because I go between document formats quite a bit and I don't have to worry about sort of like constantly editing my content. It sort of just works out of the box. The one place where this might be annoying is if you wrote something like output location column and you wanted your plot to appear in the next sort of in, in a two column layout in your PDF, it won't give you an error saying, I didn't do that for you. It just does its best. And so it's on you to sort of inspect your document to make sure that things look how you want them to look. So we've talked about um, two um, document formats so far. So I have now ended up with, um, you know, a PDF. Um, actually, let's make this an HTML. Let's go back to making this an HTML. Um, so I have an HTML uh, output for my document. And those slides that I showed you from the beginning, uh, where I was going through when I was introducing Quarto, those exist in this, um, um, in this project as well. Uh, in a file called talk.qmd. And before I move to the next step of creating a website that brings these things together, I'm gonna clean up my uh, project a little bit. Any output files, I am going to erase, delete, just so we can sort of start fresh with um, two input files, index.qmd and talk.qmd and a references file that I need in order to do my citation properly and a folder with images, all right? Um, and let's go ahead and create a new text file. So it's going to be a plain text file and I'm going to name it specifically underscore quarto.yaml. This is a file name that Quarto understands to say this is going to give me some metadata at the project level. And we generally talk about a Quarto project when we have multiple Quarto documents that we want to bring together in some way. And once we name it that, I can actually edit this document on the fly and Quarto will help me with some um, sort of YAML completion again. I want a Quarto project. I want the type of it to be a website. You can see other options I have are a default project, which just says you have a few documents together. Tell me how to bring them together, a website or a book. Websites and books are very similar in Quarto. Frankly, the only, the biggest, let's say, maybe not the only difference, but the biggest difference between them is that in a book, you can cross-reference between different chapters because different files then become different chapters versus in a website, sort of your individual pages are uh, what you can cross-reference within. So I say that I want to make a website and then I need to tell Corto something about how I want this website to be laid out. I am going to title this, hello, Corto. Um, Give it a name like this. And then let's say that I want a nav bar on uh, the left. And I want two things uh, referenced. I want my index.qmd. And I want my talk.qmd files referenced. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to do, because I'm working in our studio and I want to leverage our studio tools for making it easier for me to build this website, I'm going to go ahead and relaunch this uh, project so that our studio relaunches with a new build tab here. Because as soon as our studio at the launch time recognizes there's a Corto YAML file, it looks in it identifies that there's a website and tells me, okay, you wanna make a website here. So let's go ahead and render our website. And now we basically have made a website with a title. It's maybe a little too long of a title. So how about we make that a little bit shorter? And then we have two pages in it. Hello penguins 
and the slide deck. We can see that the title of the slide deck looks absurd here, right? So let's go ahead and give these a uh, slightly better name. So I can say, this can be my home and this can be my slides. And you can see that Corto is sort of like building the website on the fly as I make changes. And so I have a document, a HTML file, and then a slide deck in my um, website. I will mention one other feature. So let's go back to um, our HTML file and talk a little bit about multi-format documents. You might have a reason why on your website you want people to be able to like download a PDF easily, for example. So we can actually say, I want to create a multi-format document. For HTML, I want everything, all of my options to be default. So I don't want other themes or anything. And similarly for a PDF, I might want it to be the same. And let's go ahead and save this. And let's let Corto render the website one more time. And so now on my web page, you can see that I have an HTML and this other format is easily accessible. So I can keep adding Word, you know, or what, whatever other formats that I want. And finally, every time I render my website, if you take a look at my background jobs pane, so I'm going to hit render website again. You can see that when it gets here, it keeps rerunning my code chunks. I don't need it to keep rerunning my code chunks. Maybe I would if I had made some changes to my code, but I might say every time I render my website, don't uh, sort of rerun my code chunks. So we can actually define some options for execution, so code execution at the project level. And Corto has a neat feature called freeze where if I set that to auto, it only re-renders your file or it reruns the code in your file if you have touched that file. So the first time that I set freeze equal to auto and I save this and I render my website, it will again run through my code. So we can see that it actually did run through some of the code there. Now, when I render it the second time, it's listing my documents, but you can see that it's not running through the code again. The LaTeX uh, PDF generation is what's still a little bit time consuming, but this is what we have. So now we have a website and what's the last step? Let's go ahead and say Corto publish. I have a variety of options for where I might want to publish this. I'm going to choose Corto Pub, which is a free hosting service for, um, you know, reasonably sized, not ginormous Corto projects. I have already synced my account here and I am going to um, call this. Hello, Corto clone, maybe. And it basically will create the website for me. So now I have basically a website for my, um, for everything that I've created so far and um, a link to my slides as well. So I can pro publish things at the project level or I can publish things at the individual um, level. Now to wrap things up, um, Corto is a command line interface. So it is a command line interface that operates independently of your computational engine. That's why it's able to tap into Knitter or Jupyter. And it basically orchestrates each step of this rendering. When we write in a QMD file and have some code cells, the computational engine will then write the plain text markdown and then Pandoc uh, will take that plain text markdown and turn it into pretty outputs. And Corto sort of does all of this so you don't have to worry about the nitty gritty of these steps. If you want to learn more, the Corto website is the best place to go for that, where we have extensive documentation, as well as on the Get Started page, a tutorial. And the tutorials depend on, you know, different uh, tools that you might use. So I have basically walked you through a version of this RStudio tutorial, but you can write Corto documents in other uh, tools as well. Um, 
Portal 1.4 should be released sometime this fall, I believe, sort of before the end of the year. And you can see a lot of new exciting features here. Um, only one of them I have briefly sort of touched on with that nice hover uh, feature with cross references, but there's a lot more to look forward to. And the Corto blog is a great place to look for sort of updates for Corto. Corto is an actively maintained project. So it gets updated pretty regularly. The release version gets updated somewhat regularly and the pre-release version gets updated pretty regularly. In order to be working with Corto, you should not feel like you have to constantly be updating. Um, however, uh, looking forward to sort of blog post updates where there is like exciting features actually being merged into the release uh, version of Corto is probably a good cadence for like how regularly to update. Thank you so much for listening and I'd be very happy to take any questions now.